going to get Lucy on primetime television in the morning and you know we'd call a press conference at five o'clock in the morning and these guys would turn up and sure enough Lucy was back on the, the front page. I don't think we were confident that the police were the, going to be the people who would suddenly find her in a warehouse in northern Tokyo somewhere and bring her back to us. We felt it would be uh, a tip-off from the public. The family's press campaign won support from Tokyo's close-knit community of British expats. I was in a, a restaurant and Tim was in there with Sophie and I called him aside and just said, look, you're, whilst you're here, you're going to need logistical um, help. I said, you're going to need offices, you're going to need, you know, telephone lines, faxes, internet. You're basically going to need to set this up as an office to stand any chance of su succeeding. Tim set up a base in Hugh's office and, crucially, a dedicated phone line for information from the public. Many calls came in to the, the hotline, which they set up, but a lot of them were, were red herrings or they were uh, people trying to be helpful who just got the wrong end of the stick. And for a long time, Tim and Sophie really had no idea what had happened to Lucy. It's more than two weeks since Tim Blackman launched his campaign to find his missing daughter. As yet, he's heard absolutely nothing and admits he's becoming increasingly desperate. As, as British people, we are surprised and upset that such a terrible thing could happen to our child in Japan. As their publicity campaign intensified, the Blackmans recruited as many high-profile people as possible. Tim persuaded the then Prime Minister Tony Blair to lobby the Japanese government and Richard Branson put out a TV appeal. I'm here today to ask for your help. Uh, Lucy All of which put pressure on the Japanese yeah. authorities. So the message was coming down to the police from the Japanese Prime Minister. You know, we've got to sort this out. The police finally agreed to pour more resources into the case, assigning 80 officers to the hunt for Lucy. But if the family were hoping that they'd get more information from detectives, they were wrong. The police wouldn't tell Tim what they were doing because they didn't want to give away details of their investigation. They would be very nice to us and uh, they would smile and, and shake our hands and all the rest of it. But by the same token, they wouldn't really tell us anything about anything in particular. And we would ask about it and they would say, well, we don't know. Lucy's mother was concerned that the Japanese police weren't following up on vital information and that precious time was being lost. Well, I was suggesting things like, you know, that she had a mobile phone, could they track that down? And, and could they track, you know, where, if there was any cameras about, could they see where she'd been and everything? And they just sort of said, you know, we, we can't answer that question. And it, it was frustrating. It was very frustrating. <laughs> Then, in August, as the search entered its second month, the police received a letter, written in English and signed from Lucy. The signature was a crude forgery, but the letter gave the family hope that she was still alive and being held against her will. There was always the possibility that we would find her alive. They were talking about... Uh, the sex trade and she might have been shipped away and she would, would have been made into a, a her heroin addict to be controlled and I think we thought we'd find her in a terrible condition somewhere, a terrible state. Despite the letter, the police appeared no nearer to tracking down Lucy or her abductor. Her increasingly frustrated mother turned to a British private detective for help. The first thing was to suss out the club, suss out the witnesses, how many, where were they, were they still willing to talk to me? I felt the club was particularly... Uh, it was the hub to this investigation, and given the fact that she had disappeared with a, a client, surely somebody could have recalled what he looked like. Did anybody else know him? Did the club know him? She would have asked the club, Mama San. A huge number of people, I would have thought, should have had information about who she left with and who this guy might have been. One hostess called Melissa did come forward. She described a man she had seen in the club with Lucy just days before her disappearance. I went back to my old colleagues in Scotland Yard 
and I got their photo imaging people to build up a photo fit from a description given by Melissa, a hostess who'd been there for the last night that Lucy had worked there. But I felt that was something the Japanese police could have done earlier. The former detective went from club to club with the likeness. He was unable to identify the suspect, but he was right to focus on the nightclub. Several Western girls working in Rapongi's hostess bars had by now phoned the Blackman's hotline. All told disturbing stories of being taken on a date or dohan by the same man. I was hearing stories from club managers, for example, who had said that one of his girls had been on a dohan with him and had come back two days later and was so seriously sick and ill. She'd obviously been attacked in some way and he'd taken her to the police station and the police had wanted nothing to do with it at all. I knew a couple of girls that it had happened to and there was a pattern developing. This man was taking them out on a dohan, drugging them and um, raping them. The attacker always gave the girls a false name, but their description of him was consistent. He was a very well-dressed, apparently very wealthy man. He spoke English well. He was quite charming. In most cases, as young women in Japan working illegally as hostesses, not speaking any Japanese, they just left it at that, wrote it down to experience. But these stories at the time were, were of course, very compelling because this was the kind of scenario in which you could imagine Lucy had gone missing. Lucy's family passed all this information on to the Japanese police. It gave them the lead they needed. By October, they had identified a prime suspect. As the months have passed, hopes of finding Lucy Blackman alive have faded, but the Tokyo police say they've now arrested a man who could be connected to her disappearance. Yohi Obara, who's 48, was driven away from his home at high speed. The Blackman family's determination to find their daughter had led detectives to a wealthy playboy named Joji Obara. They charged him with raping five women who had worked in hostess bars. I didn't really link him enormously with the fact that Lucy had gone missing, but I, I probably couldn't accept the idea that somebody had, had done what he had, uh, as it turned out, done. Police were about to uncover a chilling picture of a rapist and killer whose crimes had gone undetected for almost a decade. Uh, they found a large number of videos of himself having sex with unconscious drugged women. He really was a serial rapist. A man was a deviant of the highest order. But would he lead police to Lucy? In Japan, the search for Lucy Blackman had led police to 48-year-old Joji Obara. A regular in Tokyo's nightclubs, he'd been preying on hostesses for years. They found in his apartment a large number of videos which he had taken of himself having sex with unconscious drugged women. This man was a serial offender. He had been violating and raping women for years and years. Joji Obara was the son of a Korean immigrant who had made a vast fortune in property and gambling. He was educated at university. He learnt uh, how to speak English. Uh, well. He had a variety of cars. He had a variety of family apartments. He was a, a, a serial good-time guy who could afford to go around all these clubs and, and certainly was well known on the club circuit. Though his face was familiar on the hostess club scene, Obara was careful to conceal his true identity, often giving out false names. But he always kept a very low profile. He never offered anyone a business card, which is usually standard practice in Japan. Obara had a routine. He would meet hostesses in a club and invite them on a date or dohan. He'd pick them up in one of his luxury cars and shower them with gifts. But then he'd reveal his true face. And his method was quite simple. He would induce young women to come back with him to his flat. He would make them unconscious and then he would strip them naked and then he would violate them in, in most dreadful ways. And he would film himself doing that. And the man was a deviant of the highest order. When they searched through his apartment, police found as many as 200 tapes on which he was seen raping different women. 
He's alleged to have been a regular client of the bar where Lucy Blackman worked as a hostess. Police who've also searched the borough's home say this is their first positive lead since she went missing four months ago. They've Detectives began questioning Obara over Lucy's disappearance, but he vehemently denied ever having met her. Then, after four weeks in custody, he suddenly changed his story. Once again, Lucy's family returned to Japan to help the inquiry. In the first instance, Obara swore he never knew about Lucy, he never met her, he knew nothing of her other than what had been in the media. But obviously he's released a statement which now says that he has met Lucy, met her once. We're beginning to think that the longer he's interviewed by the police, the more information he's going to volunteer. But Obara didn't tell the police anything else. With the search for Lucy now in its fifth month, the police needed more information. So her father, Tim, made an international appeal. It's become apparent that we are very much in need of more information to come forward. And in particular, we would like uh, girls who used to work in the Roppongi, who now have gone home, if they know of this man or whether they've experienced a similar abduction, it's vitally important that they come forward. The appeal worked. Among those who came forward was a man with vital new information. The case against Ibarra was about to become even stronger. In Australia, a young man named Robert Finnegan read about this and uh, it, it struck him very powerfully because he, years earlier, eight years earlier in 1992, he'd been the fiancé of a young woman called Karita Ridgeway. And when these stories started coming out of Japan of a rapist who drugged his female hostess victims, this rang a very alarming bell. Karita Ridgeway was an aspiring actress. Just 21 years old, she had taken work as a hostess in Tokyo to pay for her studies. Karita had gone on a dohan with a customer. When she returned, she was seriously ill. She was taken to hospital. She fell unconscious, and a, a few days later, she died of, of liver failure. Uh, the uh, explanation at the time had been that she had died of natural causes. But Robert Finnegan had never quite been able to believe that. Credit to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police that they linked the two cases and reinvestigated Karita's case and then found evidence directly linking Obara uh, to Karita's death. When police reviewed the videotapes found in Obara's apartment, they found one showing Karita unconscious on his bed. Bit by bit, they were able to piece together what had happened. After meeting Karita on a date, Obara had taken her back to one of his apartments. There, he had given her a drink laced with sedatives. Later, he filmed his attack on her while using chloroform to keep her sedated. In high concentration, chloroform is toxic. It was this that killed her. Obara, already accused of five rapes, was now charged with killing the young hostess. The police case against Obara was compelling, but by the end of 2000, they still had no evidence linking him to the disappearance of Lucy Blackman. January 2001, Lucy had been missing for six months. In England, her family were still clinging to the hope that she may still be alive. In Japan, the search for Lucy was about to come to a tragic end. In the past few days and weeks, this beach has been the focus of police investigators' attention. Early in February, in one of the coldest times of the year, when they were on the verge of giving up, they found in a seaside cave close to one of George Obara's apartments a series of packages buried not very far under the sand. And when they dug them up, the packages, sure enough, contained a dismembered body cut into eight parts. This was the outcome the Blackman family had feared, the discovery of a woman's remains. They were found hidden in a cave... They finally phoned me a few hours later, uh, saying that the body that they had discovered on the beach definitely was Lucy's that the uh, head was encased in concrete and that they'd chipped the concrete away and 
found blonde, all her blonde hair, and they'd already had her.